Last week I learned something new, and I thought it was interesting enough to share. The subject is the refraction of light in the pressure gradient of the atmosphere. Specifically, what does light do when it shines directly across the gradient? My first answer to this was wrong. I'll share that with you, as well as my faulty reasoning, but then I'll cover the correct answer, including the mathematics behind that. Let's set up the situation. As is common in our own atmosphere, let's consider a medium with a variation in index of refraction. Put simply, the air is denser down low and thinner up high. This variation in density causes a variation in the speed that light travels through the air. Light travels slightly slower through the dense air than it does through the thin air. We'll be calling this a refraction gradient. If we look upwards or downwards through the gradient like this, the change in light speed will cause the light to refract, just like looking through a lens. But what happens if we look straight across it? My first thought was that the light should go straight across it. I've already mentioned that this is wrong, but first a quick word on why I thought it. Being comfortable with Snell's law and eager to avoid delving into calculus, I imagined reducing the situation from a continuous gradient to a series of discrete layers much like this image. Light passing along a single one of these layers would not refract. Sounds reasonable. So how am I so certain that that's wrong? Here's an excellent video showing this effect, and we can see that the light does bend. Mick West has prepared a solution of sugar in water. There's more sugar down at the bottom, and that causes a refraction gradient, just like the one we're talking about. When the light curves through the tank, there's a point where it reaches a peak. At that point, the light is traveling straight across the gradient, and as we can all see, it continues to bend. So now you've seen what light really does, let's try to explain it. First, let's discuss Snell's law. This is what we learned in physics class. When light enters a medium with a different index of refraction, it bends. The angle of bend is given by this equation. Sine theta 2 over sine theta 1 is equal to the ratio of the index of refraction of material 1 to that of material 2. Theta 1 and theta 2 are the angles between the light and the normal or the perpendicular to the surface. And notice that the ratios are inverted. It's sine theta 2 over sine theta 1 on the left, but it's n1 over n2 on the right. This is correct, of course. But why does this happen? The usual explanation involves a marching band. I don't have any band characters, so I picked up this skeleton warrior. This is a free demo from Polygon Blacksmith. There are a bunch of different characters available, so there's a little plug for them. The marching band, or in our case, the army of the dead, marches in perfect lockstep until they run across a patch of mud. The mud slows them down. When the army hits the mud straight on like this, the skeletons slow down and the rows bunch up, but they don't bend. However, if the army hits the mud at an angle, the lines don't just bunch up, they bend. This is refraction. Our army of the dead represents a wave moving through the medium. In our case, that wave is light. You've heard that light is made of photons, but our wave is made of skeletons. There's a visualization of how refraction works. Let's try it on the refraction gradient. My first idea was to imagine the gradient as a series of layers, and I figured the layer would just split the light like so. But that's not right, is it? The simple explanation goes something like this. Quoting from a page by Andrew Young of San Diego State University, the simplest solution to the horizontal ray paradox is to remind ourselves that rays are an unrealistic mental construct. In reality, we always have a beam of light. Infinitely narrow rays don't really exist. Let's put the army into a refraction gradient. Here, I'm showing the light blue as the lower index of refraction, faster light, and the dark blue is the denser air with the higher index of refraction, the slower light. As the skeletons march through the gradient, the ones in the dark blue are slowed down more, and that causes the marching line to bend. This is exactly what we saw with the laser in the sugar water. That skeleton army is a pretty good visualization of refraction, 
But I remember the first time I saw this explanation with the marching band, and I thought to myself, sure, I see that the wave slows down and gets squashed, but that doesn't really explain why it needs to bend. That's right, me from the past, very insightful. For a deeper explanation of exactly why the beam bends, let's take a look at Huygens' principle. Huygens realized that light is a wave. Like all waves, that means it propagates as a wave front. Wave front? What do you mean? Let's look at a wave. This is my illustration of your garden variety pressure wave. Imagine these dots are air molecules. When the green thing, that's supposed to be a speaker, moves to the right, it pushes the air molecules along. Now, the air molecules are all bunched up next to the speaker. This is an area of high pressure. The bunched up molecules push against each other. Hey, quit crowding me, move over. The crowded molecules push the ones next to them out of the way. Those push the ones next to them, and so on down the line. This is how a wave front moves through a medium. That's the basics of waves. But Huygens added the insight that every point along the wave front is acting like a source on its own. We can see this happening with the speaker demo. Right here, the molecules are all bunched up, and that causes the wave to continue on. Now the bunching has moved on a little, forming a new wave front. The molecules on the new wave front push the ones next to them. What we see is that the wave front is the place where the pushing happens. Like any wave, the wavelets coming off the wave front interfere with each other. And where that interference peaks, you have your new wave front. Imagine a wave beginning with these three dots. The three dots are supposed to represent an entire line of the wave front. Imagine there are more dots in between these dots. As the wave expands, the neighboring waves interfere. Where they all join together forms the wave front. Up at the top and at the bottom, the wave is weak, but along the right side, the little wavelets are all bunching up, and that creates a bigger peak. We can replace every point along the peak of the wavefront with a new point source. This new wave expands as well, and that new wavefront has point sources on it too. And on and on it goes. That's how a wavefront moves through a medium. So far, that probably seems pretty obvious, but it gets interesting when the wavefront encounters a medium change. Math warning. We're about to do some math. If you're allergic to math, you may want to avert your eyes for this next part. It could get a little scary. Remember our old friend Snell's Law? We can verify that empirically, but we can back it up with math too. It turns out Snell's law is the natural outcome of applying Huygens' principle to a medium transition. Let's have a beam of light that starts here at points A and B. The green lines show the light traveling to the right. When the light hits point D, the bottom of the beam touches the glass. The top of the beam is still in the air at point C. The top of the beam continues on through the air until it hits the glass at point E. The light in the air is traveling at speed v1. If we say the amount of time it takes to get from point C to E is t, then the distance between C and E must be v1 times t. During this time, the bottom of the beam is already in the glass, moving at speed v2. During that same period of time t, the bottom of the beam travels a distance of v2 times t. We can tell how far the light can travel through the glass in that time, but the question is, what direction? During time t, the light could have landed anywhere on this circle. Well, anywhere on the circle inside the glass. What Huygens suggests is that we consider point D as a source for the wave. The wave actually radiates in all directions from that point, making this circle. The wave front is the spot where all the waves combine at this time. That's going to happen along this line from point E to point F. At this moment in time, the top of the wavefront has just reached point E. The bottom is somewhere on this circle, and those connect along this line. This red line is the new wavefront, and the beam continues on in this direction. 
That red line deserves a closer look. When the top of the beam hits point C, the bottom is just hitting the glass at point D. The wavefront expands outward from point D, while the top of the beam continues on to point E. This circle shows how far the wavefront has moved through the glass during that time. Let's add a point in the middle of the beam. The middle of the beam hits the glass halfway between the top and the bottom. At that point, we'll let the wave expand outward until the moment the top of the beam hits point E. That gives a radius of 1 half V2T. Put another point quarter of the way down the beam and do the same thing. This time we get a circle of 1 quarter V2T. And one more three quarters of the way down gives us a circle of three quarters V2T. Together, these circles create the wave front along the red line. I'll just zoom in a little and we'll calculate the new wave front. The dotted line is perpendicular to the glass. That makes this angle theta 1 and this angle theta 2 from Snell's Law. The triangle CDE is a right triangle with a 90 degree angle at point C. The angle at point E is 90 minus theta 1, and that makes this angle at point D theta 1. Doing the same thing for triangle DEF gives us theta 2 at point E. These two right triangles share a hypotenuse. Let's call that H. The sine of an angle is the opposite over the hypotenuse. Let's write that down for theta 1. Sine theta 1 equals V1T over H, opposite over hypotenuse. Let's do the same thing for triangle DEF, and we'll get sine of theta 2 equals V2T over H. Snell's law is about the ratio of these two sides, so let's divide them. The H's and the T's cancel out, and that gives us sine of theta 1 over sine theta 2 equals v1 over v2. That's almost Snell's law, but we want this in terms of the index of refraction. The index of refraction is the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in the medium, so n equals c over v, or v equals c over n. Substituting c over n for each of our v's gives us cn2 over n1c. Cancel out those C's and voila! Snell's Law, derived by applying Huygens' principle and a little trigonometry. Well, that was pretty awesome, right? No? Well, I enjoyed it. If that didn't scare you off, let's apply the same technique to the refraction gradient and see if we can calculate the curvature. Like before, we'll start with a beam aimed to the right. We'll say the beam is H tall. Don't forget that refraction gradient. The air pressure is greater down low, and that means the index of refraction is greater down low. For simplicity's sake, let's just suppose a linear gradient of refraction. So let's say the top of the beam in green has an index of refraction n1. The bottom of the beam is h lower, so that makes the index of refraction there n2. And according to our formula for our linear gradient, n2 equals n1 plus k times h. The bottom of the beam is a hair lower, so the speed there will be v2. This edge is just a bit shorter. And as we just saw, Huygens' principle tells us that the speed difference will cause the beam to bend. The question before us is, how much does it bend? How do we even describe a curvature? What I came up for this was to ask, if this curve were a circle, what would the radius of that circle be? Now don't mistake me here, I'm not saying the curve is a circle, but any curve can be broken down into a series of little arcs. Each little piece of the curve can be represented as part of a circle, each with a different radius. The fraction of the curve we're interested in is the precise instant where the beam is exactly perpendicular to the gradient. At that moment, the beam is curving downward as if it were following a circle, and we'll call a radius to the bottom of the beam R2. During this brief moment, the beam sweeps through an arc, and let's say the angle of that arc is alpha. If we express alpha in radians, 
that makes the length of the arc very simple. The bottom of the beam travels a distance V2T, and the length of the arc is R2 alpha. The top of the beam travels V1T, and the radius of the top of the arc is R2 plus H. Like we did for Snell's law, let's take a ratio of these. V1T over V2T equals R2 plus H times alpha over R2 alpha. The T's cancel, as do the alphas. A little simplification and solve for R2. Remember that N equals C over V? That means V1 over V2 equals N2 over N1. If we replace the N2s with our equation from before, we get this, which simplifies to this. So we've got this equation for R2, and we have this equation for V1 over V2. Now, we just substitute V1 over V2 in this equation here, and we get that. The 1s cancel out, so we got this. Now, the H's cancel, and finally we get that. R2 equals N1 over K. Sweet! Uh, what does that even mean? Think of it this way. The smaller the radius, the tighter the curve. A straight line has an effective radius of infinity, and that happens when K is zero. The bigger K gets, the tighter the curvature. Okay, but what was K again? K is the gradient of refraction. K is how much the index of refraction changes as you go up and down. So this equation tells us that the curvature is caused by the refraction gradient. More gradient means more curvature. So there you go. We started with Huygens' principle and use that to show how light actually bends as it crosses a refraction gradient. For one last thing, light bending in a circle suggests an interesting opportunity. What if we could get the light to bend at the exact same radius as the Earth? Could we get a beam of light to travel over the surface indefinitely? Andrew Young goes on to estimate what sort of temperature gradient or lapse rate we would need to make that happen. He comes up with a final answer of around 0.12 degrees per meter, and he notes that temperature must increase with altitude. He further points out that this is roughly 20 times the lapse rate we expect in general and inverted, so certainly not typical for the atmosphere in general. But we do expect a temperature gradient that is substantially greater near the surface, and temperature inversions are known to occur. So. If you wanted a beam of light to follow the curve of the Earth, you'd need to get down low to the surface, and you'd want to do it when the surface is cooler than the air. I'll end it with a shout out to Bobby Shafto. He's been trying to catch this phenomenon on video. He hasn't captured it yet, but he does great work, and my analysis here suggests it should be possible. Bobby, my suggestion is that you get down low to the water when the cool California currents are chilling the air. I'm looking forward to it.